Uh, good, good, good evening, everyone. Thank you to the Society for inviting me to give this talk today, especially with the suitability of the timing being so close to Remembrance Sunday. Thank you, Alex, for the kind introduction. Before I start, I should say that though I am in the process of becoming a historian by training, and I do have some background in literary studies, this talk is not intended to be too heavily weighted in either direction, but is more a look at what is known and what new archival material has become available about Kipling's work in relation to this topic. Part of the talk comes from a student presentation I did in December last year, but parts of it are completely new based on recently digitized and uh, archives from the Commonwealth War Graves Commission. My talk today is about a, an event that took place in 1922 known as the King's Pilgrimage. And I think it should be on the screen now, should it? Can you, there's someone on waiting room. So should we play, play it now? Uh, yeah, I just need to get the, um, who's in the waiting room. We can see the waiting room thing, Mike. It was there before. Oh, that mine, yeah. Okay, cool. So, so that everyone can see the first slide of the screen now, yes? So, my talk today is about an event that took place in 1922, known as the King Pilgrimage. This was a tour by King George V of the cemeteries and memorials being constructed on the Western Front in Belgium and France for British Empire troops that had died in the Great War. I will be looking at both the tour itself and the associated publication and poem of the same name, considering the origin of the tour and the way in which, as well as honouring the dead, it was used to spread a message of peace and to promote Anglo-French relation, the Entente Cordiale. So I first became aware of the King Pilgrimage around 13 years ago, when I acquired a first edition hardback copy of the book um, that was published in the aftermath of the tour. Um, and just, if you could hand that round to the Certainly. audience. And this is a more recent uh, edition of the book. Um, for this talk, uh, I take a look at the reaction to the tour and its key event, a speech made by the King at the concluding ceremony. Um, so this speech, um, uh, was composed by Kipling, though this was not public knowledge, and the news report to the speech appeared at the same time as the poem that Kipling had published in the newspaper to mark the culmination of this tour. Um, so, quoting the correspondent of the Daily Mail, the words of the speech are now being flashed all over the earth. It is my contention that the speech is the central element of the tour here, and to truly understand its impact, it is necessary to trace its reception as reported in newspapers at the time, both local, national, and international. Key to this understanding is that reporting then was done almost exclusively through newspapers. The first BBC radio broadcast would take place in October of that year. Neutral footage does exist to parts of the tour in Belgium and of the state visit in Brussels that preceded it, but I have not been able to find any footage of the rest of the tour. To give some additional background, the king had succeeded to the throne in 1910. His son served in the war and he played an active role that included visits to the front. Events in the news at the time of the tour included developments relating to Ireland, which was a drawn out and bloody process of partition. Uh, the king had opened the new Northern Ireland Parliament with a speech in Belfast the previous year that had appealed for peace. Also prominent, were the often stormy negotiations over post-war reparations 
with the tour coinciding with a major conference at Genoa, the effective failure of which would presage the end of British Prime Minister Lloyd George's time in power. The cartoon here shows him attempting to promote peace under the warring sides of France versus Russia and Germany. The King's Pilgrimage, by its very name, also served as an example for the ongoing visits by the bereaved to the war cemetery. So uh, I'm now going to look at the origin of the tour, at who wrote the King's speech and the role played by two people, Fabian Ware and Rudyard Kipling. Ware was the driving force behind the Imperial War Graves Commission, which was established by Imperial Charter in 1917. Kipling, author and poet, well known to the audience here, um, was famous as the unofficial bard of empire and was awarded the 1907 Nobel Prize for Literature. During the war, he helped to produce propaganda, which included recruiting speeches. And afterwards, following the wartime death of his son, he was literary advisor to the commission and responsible for its memorial inscription. Kipling also, along with Ware, did much of the publicity work of the commission. Kipling went on to write other royal speeches, but his role was not publicly acknowledged at the time, as that would have been a breach of protocol. As well as the published biography, much research on Kipling has been made available by the Society on its website and in its journal. From the diaries of Kipling and his wife Carrie, and from correspondence between Kipling and Ware and others, it is possible to construct a timeline of the genesis of the tour, the speech, and the associated poem and book. While the public historiography is inconsistent on this, it is clear from the archival research by Michael Aidan that the tour was suggested to the King's advisors by Kipling during correspondence on another matter. From this starting point, and it is crucial to note that Kipling was clear from the beginning about the potential for propaganda, Ware took on the mammoth task of meticulously organizing the three-day event with visits to multiple cemeteries and memorial sites. The diary entries shown here show Kipling drafting the speech from the 4th of April and, and then from the 3rd of May, he wrote um, that by the 3rd of May, he had finished a poem that would be published in the newspapers alongside the speech. It is my view that this gave added prominence to the whole event. Using Kipling's fame and the attention that would be paid to the king to promote the ideals contained in both speech and poem. Crucially, the diary entries after the tour show the Kipling reporting on the praise given to Kipling's work by the king on the overall success of the speech and tour, which was referred to by Kipling as, quote, the, the little game, and emphasizing the planned and intended boot to Anglo-French relations. And Carrie wrote in her diary, quote, Rudd feels most useful as between France and England and the empire, he is glad he proposed it and it was acted on, unquote. However, an examination of the news report at the time showed that the effects went further than this, prompting elements of performative ritual. The King's speech and Kipling's poem and the ideals expressed within them were used and quoted in a wide range of settings, from church sermons to organ recitals, after dinner speeches, veteran remembrance events, and in particular, local war memorial unveiling. Before turning to this, I will look at how the tour was organized and reported in the press. From the outset, the tour itinerary was kept secret as the pilgrimage was intended to be private without the pomp or ceremony of a state visit. The King traveled by a combination of royal train with the timetable shown here and then, and then cars to reach the often remote cemeteries. Certain elements of the tour were trailed to the press in advance with a pre-publication -pre advert in the USA shown here. The concluding ceremony and speech at Turling Thun Cemetery near Boulogne was announced in the papers on the preceding days, followed by extensive news coverage of the final day and the text of the speech itself, which the King read out on Saturday the 13th of May. Uh, the poem itself was published prominently on the editorial pages and the front pages of major newspapers in the UK and the USA. Uh, the, the Times here and the, the Evening Star in Washington, D.C. 
However, the response the following day in the New York Times was a misreading of the intent of the poem. Um, the, the final line of the poem. Uh, sorry, the final line of the, of the poem, yeah, the final stanza of the poem, line of the poem was, we they redeemed, denied their blood and mocked the gains it won. So, um, actually, if you could hand that round, that, 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 that's the speech and poem. And um, the newspaper article took, took that at Kipling, thinking that though the war was won, the peace had been lost, and that was not Kipling's intent at all. Um, and then, as you see, the newspaper article said, that is a lamentable conclusion for anyone to reach, and the Kipling of other days would have seen more clearly. Um, if Kipling never saw that, he would have been um, horrified at that. Um, and it's quite similar to what happened with the Sheridan interview. I'm not sure how familiar people are with, with this, but it's um, been covered by Roger Ayres on the Kipling Society page relating to the poem. Um, and that happened in, in November of the same year. Uh, but I'm just going to move on now to a different review. <laughs> Uh, which appeared in a Kentucky newspaper, uh, Kipling on a Kipling theme. And I was quite um, uh, surprised when I came across this, but then I uh, read a bit more about it and it appeared to be an example of um, the uh, perennial fascination of America with Kipling and his role as the Bard of Empire. Uh, the reviewer concluded um, about the poem, uh, it is Kipling, and as Kipling, it is literature. Returning to the reports of the tour, some appeared in the Saturday and Sunday papers, but most major papers covered the speech in their editions of Monday the 15th of May, followed by coverage in the weeklies and the main illustrated newspapers of the time, the Illustrated London News and The Sphere, shown here. Uh, the editorials in the newspapers combined opinion on the speech with views on the political storm around the Genoa Economic Conference, sometimes attempting to link the two. As one newspaper col col columnist said, quote, there have been two big subjects of conversation during the weekend, the one Genoa and the other, the King's speech from the battlefield to war mourners. The tour was also reported on in the French press in a similar vein, and it appeared to especially arrange translation of the speech was made available in French, as seen here in major newspaper Le Tom. The speech by a French general, which also features in the book, is reported on page two, shown on the right here. However, as I've said, the main point of the tour was the wide publicity given to the King's speech. Uh, you have to remember that only a small number of people would have known that Kipling had authored the speech. The propaganda aspects relating to Anglo-French relations, and this was noted in Carrie Kipling's diary, uh, that the speech Kipling uh, gives here was a, a big success at the first meeting of the Associated Franco-British Societies. And but this was actually chaired by Lord Derby, chair of the Imperial War Grave Commission, uh, former British ambassador to France. Um, and as you can see from the quote here, um, this was a, a week after the King's speech had been given, and he, Lord Derby said that there spoke the heart of England, high above party politics or disputes of any kind. And he was looking forward to a real alliance, the real and only foundation for the peace of the world. And this reflects um, uh, worries in European society at the time that war was going to break out again. That it was a very fragile peace. Um, and then and Kipling, when he gave his, the toast at this dinner, in a, in a bit more bombastic style, um, uh, talked about um, England and France gathering, preserving and giving forth all that was most essential to civilization since Rome fell. Uh, and as was reported on the Times, it, it was a very popular response. Um, but the political mood was, uh, was quite difficult at the time between um, Britain and France. And a lot of the newspapers were 
essentially the the main newspapers in each country were attacking each other each, each other's countries um, over the reparations question and how to properly settle a, a proper peace in Europe. Um, and this is shown by this comment by a, a diplomat talking about British jingoism rose up against French jingoism and in vain did King George and the Queen pay pilgrimage to our devastated region. So if you now look at the book itself, uh, it was authored by an Australian journalist called Frank Fox. Uh, and he, uh, the biographical articles about him describe him as uh, an advocate for imperialist causes. And um, he uh, served in the First World War. And he also, um, he published, he published several other books. Uh, I, I believe he was probably known to Fabian Ware through the connection with the Morning Post. And um, I didn't have time to include it in here, but um, I've recently looked at archive um, material where Frank Fox writes to Fabian Ware and says after the book was published, and he says it, it was a labor, labor of love for him to do this book. Um, so it was, um, it was a subject um, very close to people's hearts at this time. Um, the, the language in the book, I'm not sure how many of you have had a chance to look at it, um, but it is actually quite um, it's difficult to describe the, the language used. Um, it's quite emotive and um, symbolic language. It, it, and some of the quotes I've given here um, is what, is what um, I term sacralizing language. So sacralizing is a term that um, is, is from, um, it, 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 it's where the um, talking about the sacrifice is made and it imbues it with more religious and cultural um, symbolism. Uh, I didn't explain that too well, but I, uh, as you can see, some of the quotes talk about um, but, um, the, the soil of France and Belgium being um, becoming holy soil to the British race because of the sacrifices made during the Great War. And this is um, a theme that you see throughout the 1920s and 30s. The, the book was advertised, um, it was published in soft coverage relatively soon after the tour. Uh, adverts for a hardback edition appeared in October, next to adverts for a book on the tour that had been undertaken by the Prince of Wales to India and Japan. And uh, the differences between the two publications and their price points show, in my view, the sort of market that Hodder and Darton were aiming at, the relatively prosperous middle class and others who could afford the book. The, the sales, though, um, the, the book had a print run of around 25,000, and these sales were being used to support the charity Aiding the Bereaved to travel to the war cemeteries. The image on the left here shows the, the strap that was um, specifically um, advertising the, the use of the profit to go toward these charities. Um, and on the right is a specially bound edition that was produced um, for the King and Queen. Uh, there was a cut down version of the book published in Australia in 1923. Uh, one of the interesting things about this is that the, the King's speech was included in full, but for some reason only the first and last standard of Kipling's poem. Uh, I'm not sure what he would have thought of that. Um, but, and then a modern edition of the book was published in 2018 by the great grandson of Frank Fox, the author of the book Tech. And just very quickly, uh, the person shown on this slide is uh, Herbert Thomas Goodland, who was one of the senior employees of the Imperial War Grave Commission in France at the time. And the reason I've included him is he would have been well known to Kipling. There's several references to him in, in his diaries and also in the, in the archive where, where they meet, because he, he, he was a great help to Kipling in some of the searches he undertook relating to his, his son and also just the general work he did with the commission. The connection is that later in life, um, Goodland, who had returned to Canada in retirement, is reported to have recited the King Pilgrimage at a coronation event 
organized by a local branch of the Kipling Society. Uh, so coming back to the tour, the actual location of the speech, which uh, again is important to remember was composed by Kipling. This slide showed the colorization of one of the black and white photographs of the king giving his speech um, in front of the cross of sacrifice in Turling Foon Cemetery. The scene was used as one of a set of 50 cigarette cards published in 1935 to mark the King's Silver Jubilee. My next slide showed the view that the King would have had while making the speech. This, so what we see here is the alignment of the cemetery with the column of the Grand Armée in the background and its statue of Napoleon Bonaparte. This historical symbolism is utilized in the speech with the line, the shadow of his monument and greatest of all soldiers. And this is also featured in the text of the book. The impact here would have been greatest on the dignitaries and the invited bereaved relatives, which would have been forming uh, a crowd, uh, a sort of semi medium sized crowd in front of the king. And then the king would have um, processed, the king and queen would have processed down this central aisle toward the stone of remembrance, where there was a Union Jack break there and some more ceremonial elements took place there. Uh, so the impact of all this would have been greatest on the people that were there. But even though there was no newsreel footage, the impact was still transmitted onward to the wider public by the newspaper reports and the photographs and also the book. The speech itself was widely praised. Uh, it just under 670 words, takes around four to five minutes to read out. It was lauded extensively in the press. Uh, comparisons were made to two famous orations for the dead, uh, Abraham Lincoln's speech at Gettysburg in the US Civil War, and the funeral oration by Pericles during the Peloponnesian War. And some of these examples here would have been the effusive um, response to what Kipling referred to as, as the immense praise given to the King's speech, which of course he knew that he'd written. Um, so some examples, uh, the Western Daily Press said that it sounded the deep diapason of remembrance and struck the clarion note of hope for the future. Uh, the Western Gazette called it a great and moving call to remembrance. The Morning Post said uh, a message had come to us, come giving us fresh hope and a higher purpose. And other reports um, emphasized how touching it was, a, a message of remarkable pathos, an address which had touched the hearts of its people and one that will be cherished wherever the English language is spoken and be remembered so long as mortal hearts are touched by mortal things. So um, at the time, uh, it, it, it do, really did have a, a big effect on, on the public, which was still uh, recovering, um, still mourning the loss of so many people uh, in the war. Um, the, so the structure of the speech um, you, you can analyze it in certain, it, it's actually very well structured and um, uh, it has, um, well, the way I describe it, the power of Kipling's oration and, and, and where I said that it was, it was only minor alterations were made when it was sent to the palace. Um, and it covered key subjects and it packed with rich and visual descriptive imagery. Uh, and it has, a lot of elements of imperial language, racial identity, religious messaging, equality of sacrifice and historical symbolism. And um, it's not always clear whether Kipling worked from initial draft provided by Ware or whether he wrote the entire text himself from the start. But what he cleared, the end product is powerful and moving. An important element of the power of the speech is the way in which the poem and the book reinforce certain parts of the message uh, the most important is the link between the final stanza of the poem and the final words of the speech. So yeah, the, the final stanza of the poem, uh, the line is, we they redeemed, then denied their blood and mocked again it won. And then the closing words of the speech, that we may be able to meet their gallant souls once more, humbly but unashamed, is a clear linkage. Um, and it also showed that some, some of the newspaper commentators who were saying how good, how good the speech was and how good, the, and then um, 
commenting a bit negatively on the poem, maybe hadn't seen the link between the two, which they might have known if it was they known it was written by the same person. But uh, it, that it is sense in which the last line of the poem was meant. Um, so in the next part of the talk, I um, will look at some examples of the performative ritual response to the event. Um, and then uh, I will finish by looking at the Italian war grave tour, which is less well, less, less well known of 1923. So in this slide, what we see is uh, the King's speech, although it was intended as a message to all his subjects, expressly expressed that way, um, some public figures took this role literally and at, saw themselves acting as messengers for the King, would, and then would read it out to, to their uh, local, in the local area. Um, there are some examples of, like, of the Lord Lieutenant of a county reading it out. Um, the example given here is the unveiling of a war memorial in Scotland by Lord Aberdeen. And he, the interesting thing here, here is that as well as talking about the, the, the sympathy and mutual concern by which King George and his beloved consort are united with the whole nation, um, he, he then wrote to the King's uh, courtiers and said that he had made this speech and he received a reply which was then published in the local paper. So here we see interaction between the King and his subjects. And there's also a reference um, to the recently established League of Nations and we see the uh, desire um, for the peace to be maintained. Oh, thank you. The example shown here of, of the community responses to the speech and the poem um, is of examples of the speech being brought into the religious space and the poem and the speech would be read out in churches and there's also a mention of uh, the poem being performed to with to find dramatic effect uh, at an organ recital and while there are only two examples I found here uh, it, it can be presumed that there were other examples and um, so what we it's yeah, both the poem and the speech are being performed together and the effect of the two together is more than each on, on their own. And there's another example here of a war memorial unveiling, but this one is where uh, the, the King's message was repackaged to apply the famous silent witnesses of desolation epithet. Um, this is, this is one of the most famous quotes from the King's speech, um, where uh, it talked about the, um, the the desolation of war, and this this is uh, repeated here, and he's applying it to all local war memorial, um, bringing them into the compass of being silent witnesses to the desolation. Some quotations of the speech were more overtly political, such as the case of the military chaplain of a battalion, who at a dinner and giving toast to hit the fallen comrades, referred to standing against what, quote, the finances were doing in a stormy Europe and ensuring that the sacrifices made in the Great War would not have been in vain. He also concluded his word with the last stanza of Kipling's poem. The most striking example is that of Louis Lucien Clot, French politician and Minister of Finance during the final war years, who negotiated over reparation from Germany. He was speaking at a dinner in Exeter, which had adopted his destroyed town of Mondidia. While Clot was most definitely maintaining his own personal political stance in relation to post-war economics, it was a very personal speech 
where he quoted the closing verse of Kipling's poem and stated, quote, these verses, which I am never weary of quoting, so pure and true is their inspiration, deserve to be pondered and repeated in every quarter of the globe, above all in our two countries. What all these examples show is that the speech and poem carried immense power for certain parts of the British public and possibly in some parts of France as well. The extent of this phenomenon deserves further investigation in my opinion, as more instances may have been documented in contemporary sources. It is important, however, not to overstate the case, as many thousands of war memorials would have been unveiled without reference to the King's word or to Kipling's poem. That the speech was discussed by the general public is shown by the letter written by the curator of the Imperial War Museum, requesting signed copies of both the King's speech and Kipling's poem. Uh, the curator said in his letter that he is coming into contact with all thoughts and conditions of people, overhearing conversations in the train, etc. I am convinced that the King's speech has made a wonderful impression, particularly at the present time. And he also wrote to Kipling, uh, associating uh, the speech and poem and asking for both to be displayed together. And where he proposed to display them was uh, together with the top of the temporary Place de Senator that had for formed the centerpiece of the museum's then entranceway display. I have been unable to confirm if the display um, did end up including the speech and the poem, but the key point is the importance assigned at the time to these two works by Kipling. As well as these examples of performative ritual and museum displays, there are a couple of cases of the speech and poem impacting the physical memorial space with grave and memorial inscriptions inspired by both poem and speech. The two examples shown here are where bereaved relatives have requested lines from the poem to be used as epitaphs on gravestones from both the First World War and the Second World War. Uh, on, on the left is the World War II casualty, Peter Anthony Lovegrave, with the epitaph, all that they had they gave, they gave in sure and single faith. And on the right is World War I casualty, Robert Sefton Adams, with the epitaph, to them that saved our heritage and cast their own away. Whether or not the approach adopted in 1922 was a success, in other words, the king undertaking a tour of cemeteries abroad and reading out a speech drafted by Kipling appeared to have been very dependent on the timing and the international context. When a similar tour was undertaken in Italy a year later, the impact was far less. While Kipling did draft a speech for the king, the tour was less extensive, no poem was written, no book appeared to have been published, and the speech did not seem to have caught the attention of newspaper editors and the public. The simplest explanation is that there were less casualties on this front and hence less bereaved compared to the Western Front. Also possibly relevant is the fact that Benito Mussolini was by this time in power in Italy and that attention was also focused on another international conference, this time the Lausanne Conference, attempting to resolve issues relating to Turkey. Uh, I've given the closing words of the King's speech here. I dare to hope wars shall not henceforth be accepted as a burden recurrent and inevitable upon mankind. For their honour's sake, and in token of our love and pride, we have so built the graves of our fallen, that they may endure a visible sign of this, our hope. But in the next few slides, I will look at this in more detail, including the question of who primarily authored the speech. Now, uh, this may not be visible um, in the room, but uh, uh, the speech in full is uh, 529 words, slightly shorter than the 1922 speech. Um, but what I was wondering what the audience would consider is whether you think this is this text is Kiplinesque in nature, maybe a question for afterwards. Um, Thomas Pinney said in his survey of the speeches that Kipling composed for the King that um, he thought that the, the of the speeches the King gave in Italy, it would be Montecchio one that Kipling had composed. Um, it's indeed very clear that this was the speech that Kipling worked on. But what is not clear in my view is the degree to which Fabian Ware contributed to this. Uh, the language used is more typical of the, out, in my view, uh, can't be sure here, of the output of Ware than Kipling. Um, 
uh, I think it should be considered a joint work. And um, the recent uh, archival documents I've looked at um, have allowed me to construct a, a timeline of the of the speech. Um, so, uh, so it starts with where right into the Pali um, with plan for the cemeteries uh, to coincide with a, a state visit to Italy, and then where right to the British ambassador to Italy to ensure that the uh, the protocol is observed that the state visit is kept separate from the commission uh, visit tour. The, the commission representing all the dominions um, is it separate to a state visit between Britain and Italy. So it's slightly complicated. Um, and then the, the cemetery uh, ceremony in Montecchio is based on the Terlink Thun one. And then where promises the palace are draft by the 1st of May at the latest. And then he starts to correspond with Kipling to try and get a speech organized. And at this point, Kipling is uh, holidaying in France. So there's a series of telegrams between them. Um, and it's, I'm going to go into the telegrams in a bit more detail on the next page. But it appeared that um, Kipling was quite ambivalent about working on the draft on his own. Um, and he was most insistent that he meet with Ware to discuss it. Uh, what Carrie Kipling reports in her diary is that Rudd worked on the King's speech um, for three or four days in April. Um, uh, so exactly what he was working on there, I'm going to discuss in the next slide. Um, but the, the other aspect here is that there was a difficulty in translating it into, into Italian. Uh, quote, it is found extremely difficult to translate the very literary English. So this is, um, it was actually in some ways easier to translate Kipling into French than into Italian. And, and they, they had a, a problem with translating it into Italian. Um, and, uh, and the final line in this timeline showed that where cabled Kipling to report Sunday, a complete success, extremely impressive. So the telegram that Kipling sent to Ware uh, seemed to indicate that either he or Ware more likely Kipling traveled on a sleeper train so that they could meet and the final form of the speech could be discussed before the 1st of May deadline. But I haven't yet been able to cross check this with the known movements of Kipling and where, and it's possible that these plans were changed at short notice. But the, the key point is Kipling twice in two telegrams said that it would be impossible for me to work from a draft unless we could meet. Convinced work should be done by someone completely complete understanding the situation and in immediate touch with you. And then he said, draft receive, which I take to mean that where sent him a draft, uh, continue for your impossibility attempting speech without meeting. So Kipling seemed quite reluctant to compose such a major speech um, without where's input, which is why I feel it, it's, it's very much a, a joint effort there. And it's quite, quite possible that Kipling uh, may have only um, burnished or embellished uh, a draft that Ware had produced, but without knowing for sure, we, we, we can't really tell. Um, there was criticism, criticism of the King's visit to Italy. Um, this appeared to relate to the brief speeches in Rome he gave, at one of which he conferred the Order of the Bath on Mussolini. And uh, he said that the crisis in Italy had been overcome under the wise guidance of a strong statesman and the, the anti-fascist in uh, Britain were really upset at this. Um, uh, but some later sources have conflated Kipling's speech uh, with these speeches, but I found no evidence that Kipling was involved at this stage in composing other speeches for the King. Uh, Pippini lists nine speeches in total that Kipling composed for the royal family. And um, in this period, there's only two, the two war grave speeches of 1922 and 1923. Uh, so if there's time, can I just check the time? Yes. Yeah, I could be another. We have another, five, five, another four minutes, yeah. Yes, okay. Um, so I'm going to play two clips here. Uh, footage does exist of the 1922 tour. I'm going to play this one first. It shows uh, the king at the grave of his cousin, Prince Maurice of Battenberg. Uh, 
Fabian Ware is in the footage. You will see him in a moment striding towards the camera. Uh, and next to the king, you will, who has a beard, King George V is the one with the beard. And Ware is striding up here with his cane, and Haig is next to the uh, king. That's Haig there, and the king is now uh, gone up to there. Um, but the other clip I've got here is um, uh, a quote of the potent advocates of peace part of the speech, quoted many years later in a more advanced broadcasting context. Um, the live BBC broadcast from the Passchendaele Centenary event on the 31st of July 2017 saw a different Prince of Wales, now King Charles III, quoting his great grandfather with the camera angle chosen to give a sweeping view of the mass graves at Tyne Cot and the iconic cross of sacrifice. Oh, sorry. After the end of the war, almost 12,000 graves of British and Commonwealth soldiers were brought here from surrounding battlefields. Today, a further 34,000 men who could not be identified or whose bodies were never found have their names inscribed on the memorial. Thinking of these men, my great-grandfather remarked, I have many times asked myself whether there can be more potent advocates of peace upon earth through the years to come than this massed multitude of silent witnesses to the desolation of war. In 1920, the war reporter Philip Gibb So, as I said at the start of my talk, some of the material was based on recently digitized material from the Commission archives. However, not all of the files relating to the King Pilgrimage have yet been made available, and more work is still possible on the details of drafting the speech. In particular, I would encourage anyone interested to take a look at the archives and see what is available on Kipling and other areas of interest. Kipling did a huge amount of work for the Commission that is sometimes not fully recognized, and he formed a close relationship, one that deepened the friendship with Fabian Ware. My final slides give some insight into that relationship, as shown by this tribute paid to Kipling by Ware in 1937, the year after Kipling died. Ware had been among the pallbearers at Kipling's funeral service at Westminster Abbey. Uh, and Ware stated that Woodrow Kipling gave of his genius freely and wholeheartedly in the service of the commemoration of the dead. Every inscription approved by the commission was his in conception or its final form. And his poem on the King's Pilgrimage in 1922 had a lasting place in the literature of our language. So my, my final slide here shows a building that would have been familiar to Kipling as it was here from 1931 onward that he and his fellow commissioners met every month. In April 1935, less than a year before Kipling's death, a new employee of the commission, Oliver Holt, began work as Ware's private secretary. The following is his keenly observed pen portrait of Kipling, written 50 years later. And there was Rudyard Kipling, one of the original commissioners and a close personal friend of the general. I was able to observe him from my seat in the window opposite. He did not often make a comment, but when he did, it was extremely pertinent. He was a compulsive doodler, making all sorts of little pen and ink sketches and abduct patterns on his name card over which his head would be closely bent. Then, when he wished to make a remark, he would throw up his head with a sudden movement, flourishing as he did so, the longest, thickest, blackest, and most beetling eyebrows I have ever seen. The movement itself and the glance that he shot through his steel-rimmed glasses seemed to make an almost audible clash, but the remark was made in a quiet, almost sing-dong tone. <laughs> I thought that the audience tonight would find that particularly appropriate. It may be that more such vignettes remain to be uncovered in the Commission archives. My final slides include details of my sources. Um, did anyone have any questions? Well, thank you so much for that speech, Christopher. Uh, I was 
That was magnificent, it's full of interesting information, and um, <laughs> particularly the final <laughs> portrait of the whole, I'd never read that before, it was delightful. And also, I didn't realise that the, the commission sat at um, that building in Grosvenor Gardens, which I'm well familiar with, uh, only because I've often waited outside it for a bus, <laughs> yes, <laughs> where yes, the coach yes, of Lobster yes. goes from. <laughs> and um, funny enough, uh, I actually been in a chess club just, just to the left of that one. Oh. Oh, <laughs> oh, like we... That's the gallery. Um, okay. We are now happy to throw the floor open to questions, either here from the room or here on Zoom. Please even raise your real hand or your virtual hand if you'd like to ask Christopher something. Yes, yes, Andrew, please go ahead. Yeah. Do you know who actually translated? Oh, um, if you wait a minute, Andrew, I'll, I'll switch the, uh, the mic over to that room mic. Do we know who translated the speech into French? I'm afraid I, I don't know. I, I believe um, it may be possible to find out um, that I, I was looking at the Italian file recently and um, there are letters um, where the draft is sent and the request for it to be translated and distributed to the press. And there's also a letter of thanks to a general who arranged for translation. Um, so there may be similar letters in the French files, which I haven't been able to look at yet. I thought it have been trusted to someone important. Oh, I can see that uh, John Rushton would like to ask a question. Yes, Mr. Rushton, please go ahead. Yes, Mr. Rushton, would you like to ask? Yeah, that was it. In your presentation, you referred to several what I would call local newspapers, such as the Essex Chronicle, the Dover Express and East Kent News, North Devon Journal, Gloucester Citizen, and Western Daily Mail. Were the was the publication was the uh, news about the King's pilgrimage also in more national papers? Uh, yes, yes. Um, they, it was um, covered in the national papers as well, and it would also have been covered in the dominions and widely around the empire. Um, I haven't. Uh, what at a previous presentation, I was asked um, whether what the response was in India, and I haven't been able to establish that yet. Um, but it would be interesting to see uh, what how how the the poem in particular was received in a place like India. Thank you. Yes, I imagine it would have been reprinted in the Times of India or another major Indian paper. Yeah. I was fascinated that it could be recited at you know, uh, evening events, not just for the dedication of war memorials, like that beautiful memorial that I know myself uh, in Linton in front of the, oh, the Swiss Star Town Hall. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, uh, but that it would be a sort of evening entertainment of a solemn sort of kind, that people would actually go recite it. Uh, and sing songs, patriotic songs, simultaneously. Yes, um, a, a lot of these war memorial unveilings would have had uh, huge, huge crowds of people at them. Um, and they were mainly at around this time in the early 20s, most of the local war, war memorials. Uh, so th this speech and poem co coincided with that period of mass unveilings of local war memorials. It should be, a, you know, you know, Rutledge has a... Oh, yes, Mr. Short, if you'll uh, just, I'll just uh, turn your... Yes, please go ahead. Sorry, as we all know, Rutledge, the publisher, has a, has a wonderful series where they give readers a, 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 an anthology, essentially, of contemporary criticisms of a given, given author. It would be absolutely splendid if we could have that for for Kipling. Uh, obviously, we don't as yet, but uh, it would be wonderful if we did. And precisely because of your brilliant presentation this evening. Yes, that would indeed be a gratifying development. I don't know if anyone in the room knows of any such uh, undertaking as a foot. But what, no. one, one, one thing I haven't been able to establish yet is precisely when it became public knowledge that Kipling had authored the speech. Um, would anyone here have any ideas on, would it have been after, after his death? 
after the even later than that? No, this is in fact news to me. I ought to know better, but I had always imagined that it was common knowledge to be the author did. Oh. No, but, so, but no, evidently, I think you're right. It, it gradually uh, leaked out. Fred, I think, did you have a, were you about to, to suggest something, Fred, as to when people found out that it was uh, that Kipling was the author of the speech? Uh, no. I was just scratching my ear. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it would be common knowledge. I mean, um, to this day, public figures have speeches written for them. And um, it's sort of, um, and it's kept, and it's kept dark. I mean, um, <laughs> I know about this because my father, Hugh Montefiore, when Robert Runcie was Archbishop of Canterbury, they were old friends from Theological College. And my father wrote a number of Runcie's speeches. Wow. Um, I suppose that would be in the Runcie's um, biography or whatever. But I don't think that, um, I think, um, in a way, the whole point of it is that this is the king speech mm -hmm. speaking and this is the king's words. Um, I would like to know when it became public, but my guess is not, not until they were both dead, it would be my guess. How well known was it uh, when Kipling wrote the, the uh, speech for the first broadcast? Um, how, how well known do you think it was that Kipling had written the speech for the first uh, radio broadcast? Oh, uh, by George yeah, that, that was in that was in the that in the thirties. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes, um, I, I I don't know, um, but again, I think that that um, I would have assumed that wouldn't have been knowledge, public knowledge at the time, um, but maybe maybe it was maybe it was by then. I, I don't know. I don't know. It, it, it's interesting because they do, they do, uh, the, the king dies I think, a few days before Kipling and it overshadowed mm -hmm. Kipling's death. Um, the, he is referred to it as the king's trumpeter. So there is some knowledge at the time that he, he had been writing for the king, but that probably shows. Hmm. Sort of ambivalent, isn't it? Yeah. I remember Kipling writing for the king. He sent his trumpeter before him. Um, and that could refer to the speeches, or it could simply um, sort of refer to the fact that, you know, Kipling was a great supporter of uh, the Empire in general and King George in particular. Yes. Um, so um, I suppose those, those in the know might, might think, oh, yes, he wrote the speeches, but... Um, Jane Ridley has written a very good book uh, about George V, maybe she too much emotion about that. Jane Ridley could have the answer, yeah. Oh, uh, Fred, you want to ask a question now? I'm just wondering if it uh, would not uh, be more the case that uh, the fact that Kipling wrote a speech for the king to broadcast on Christmas Day on the BBC would be more widely known because uh, there presumably would have been a lot more people involved in the production of the whole thing and uh, word might have leaked out where that might not have been the case with um, the uh, earlier speech. Um, yeah, I, quite possibly. I, th I think there's, um, the, uh, by, by that time, the, the radio broadcast medium was more established. And uh, I think there's also, uh, I've recently been looking at the radio broadcasts, which were much shorter that that Fabian Ware did on on Armistice Day, and uh, he started those in 1926, and he did them every year uh, around Armistice Day up until 1947, just uh, a couple of years before he died. Um, and even though they were very short, um, uh, well, not, not that short, they're about 10, 10, 15 minutes long. Um, but the uh, the language used in them is quite similar to the language in, in these two speeches, and um, uh, it'd be interesting, I think, some, to, to look at some of these speeches. And even though there's a certain common language used in all of them, um, just the the 
Yeah, the, the language is, is an interesting topic because um, uh, I think I mentioned a couple of times that, that Thomas Pinney uh, in the, uh, the book Un Uncollected Speeches, I think, is there's a, an appendix in the back where he goes into the nine speeches um, he's done for the royal family, which includes some for the Prince of Wales, the future Edward VIII. And, um, uh, and he also wrote, Kipling also wrote the mess a message that the Queen wrote. Uh, it, it published as if the Queen had written it. It was a message from the Queen to the mothers of the empire, published in 1928. Uh, as part of the War Graves of the Empire publication uh, that was effectively advertising the work of the Imperial War Grave Commission. Um, and uh, that was just another example of, of him writing for the royal family. It was a curious coincidence, Christopher, that uh, both the original speech and then subsequent Italian speech, which may or may not have been written by Kipling, both of those were delivered by King George V at the same time that a major international conference was happening. Yeah. yeah. Lausanne was obvious, but then I hadn't actually heard of the Genoa uh, Economic Conference. Yeah, the, the Genoa Conference is less, less well known, but um, there were like, a whole series of these, and it's it's amazing how many of them that there were in the 1920s. It seemed like they were mm. just trying to iron out bits of the Versailles Treaty that hadn't quite been resolved. Was it, many of the terms of which, of course, they would roundly betray, right, anyway, in a diplomatic way of things. Yes, yes. But did anything in the speech have any bearing on this uh, economic conference that was happening at the same time? Uh, could be construed as having a bearing on, on the no, economic negotiations? No, well, there is the, the king is quite, um, there's a, a little bit of a diplomatic protocol aspect. Um, he quite insisted that during the tour, it was a state visit to Belgium, but it wasn't a state visit to France. Mm -hmm. So while there was the right protocol was observed in Belgium for a state visit, once he crossed over the border into France, he was incognito again, although he wasn't really. Um, but um, there were proposals that he meet with the French president, um, to, uh, I can't remember who it was at the time, but, um, and he, he was like, no, I, I can't meet with the French president. It would look wrong because there is negotiation going on in Genoa. And it would look like there's another meeting going on here doing it. So they avoided that. Um, but he did he did meet with Ferdinand Bach um, at Notre Dame de Lorette. And that was a quite quite a, a widely publicized meeting with him and Haig. Um, and yeah, there's a lot a lot more in, in, in the book if you ever have a chance to read through it, um, the different places they visited. And then there's a nice there's a nice bit if you if you read the bits about Kipling um, in the in the diaries and other places uh, where he meets the king in Flamerting Cemetery in Belgium, um, and I, I can't remember that one or the one in Meirut Cemetery, but he he basically his role is to drive the High Commissioner Philip Larkin around on this tour and to bring him to Turling Thune Cemetery where they they all congregated for the big event, but they also wanted to tour and see other places. But they did it kind of separately from the king. Um, but there's one point where they do meet, and he 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 presented to the king. But because he's wearing his driving driving um, uh, clothes, they're not suitable to meet the king. So he had to do a quick change into top hats and um, <laughs> clothes. And he did this in a little 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 Belgian cottage. That um, and and, and it, it's quite humorous the way it's described. If you if you have a look at that. We have a photograph of that, right? With, with, with Kipling in the top hat. Right? So do we not have a photograph of that with Kipling in the top hat? Uh, yeah, the one at the front of, the, of one of the letters, volume five of yeah. the letters. And um, there's, a, there's a photograph of Kipling with the king yeah. um, in the cemetery. It's quite a nice photo. I believe it's the one, the one that was in the presentation. Uh, yeah. uh, yeah. uh, the, uh, he was at the, the speech. He was there at the speech and he was spoke to the king afterwards. The king spoke to him in carry afterwards and uh, they and I believe this was probably the point at which this this friendship developed between him and the king later um, they uh, he was later invited to Balmoral and it, it probably from that point on that point that the that this friendship developed are there any uh, further questions uh, from you were there on zoom or out here in the room Oh, yes, Mike, please go ahead. Yeah. I was oh, let me just turn the microphone over to you. 
yeah. trying to ask, do we know when, who was the first Kipling biographer to pick up the fact that Kipling wrote the King's Speech? Was it one of the unofficial ones or, or was it Birkenhead or, or, or Carrington or indeed later? <laughs> no, yeah, it's, yeah. One would suspect to be one of the earlier ones who were more familiar with Kipling's own social circles or mm. people like Birkenhead who were, who were more socially elite and would have been perhaps privy to that information. Uh, before it was public knowledge. Mm -hmm. yes. Unless they were appropriately circumspect about how she mentioned it. Mm -hmm. That was one of the things in Birkenhead that, uh, that uh, wasn't like <laughs> was submitted. Oh, because you're referring to the, the initial rejection of yes. the, the, yeah, yes. Birkenhead's version. Mm -hmm. yes. oh, any other questions? Oh, Jan. It's not so much a question, is it? As a comment. Um, you were saying that the um, speech in Italy didn't make such an impression as the French one had. And I guess this is not surprising because, um, you know, the, the battlefront, the Western Front, so many British soldiers had died there. And um, you know, not so many British soldiers had died in Italy, and of course Kipling had reported from Italy um, in the war in the mountains, but I can see that from the kind of British population um, uh, point of view, it was more of a minority interest. Um, and so then fewer people would have a personal investment, but an awful lot of families um, would have lost a member in France. Far more than it is today. Yeah, I, 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 I would agree, I would agree with that. Yes, um, there's. It's interesting that the the king did seem to take more quite an interest in, in Italy in relations with Italy, um, either prompted by this tour, but later on he suggested that there was another project that the commission was involved in, um, some cathedral tablet they were erecting in France and Belgium. And it appeared that the king actually suggested um, that they do the same in Italy. And they did actually go so far to have a design for tablet to be erected in an Italian cathedral. But they, it met some, some opposition and they were told that this sort of thing is not done in Italian cathedral. Um, and the idea was dropped. But the, um, there, there was quite an attempt to cultivate relations between uh, Britain and Italy in the same way as Britain and France. But it never appeared to be quite the same. There, there are these differences, um, both, both Ware and Kipling were, 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 were ardent Francophiles. Um, and while they did um, uh, understand, for want of a better word, Italy, um, it, it was that you get the impression that a lot of their focus was on France, understandably, because of the number of casualties there. That's a good point, Dan, about, of course, Kipling knowing the Italian front intimately. And that along with one other thing, which is the absence. So there's, there's two things which lead me to think maybe he didn't write that Italian speech. One being the absence of any topical references to the Italian front, which he knew well, and also the absence of any sort of classical references that you think he might have been tempted to make for a speech that was to be delivered in, in Italy. But he, he did actually add in something, uh, the initial draft of the speech, just before it was um, uh, going to be read out, he did ask for another line to be put in saying um, uh, about the, uh, about how the, the mountain passes where these cemeteries were, had been defended in Asia's past from other assailants. Uh, that possibly a reference to Hannibal coming over the Alps, maybe. But um, but it's quite interesting that he uh, he did, there are these like hints and illusions, but not not quite in the same way. As mm. you said. Uh, I, I wonder, as an editor, what, whether the reason why he was so keen to meet Ware and talk over the street over the speech 
is that he may have wanted to restructure it. I mean, you made the point how masterly um, is the structure of the, of the speech at Terlicht uh, in the six parts and so on. And, um, you know, Kipling was a very experienced writer um, in a way that Fabian Ware was not. Um, and it would really be impossible, I think, you know, you, you know if he looked at it and said, this thought this has got very good stuff, but it's a bit of a mess and it needs to be reorganized. You really have to do that with the person. You can't, you, very, very difficult to do that by letter without, um, getting, without getting across somebody. And that, that might be it. It, is, it, it might be, um, as you say, burnishing it. Perhaps saying, look, this bit you've got here, it would be more effective at the end, kind of thing. I don't know, it's all speculation, but it's, it's just a thought. <laughs> ah, well, if there are no further questions, then uh, we're about to take our dinner here uh, in the West End of London. Uh, but thank you all for attending tonight. Please now let's have a round of applause for our speaker, Christopher Kreutzer. And goodbye to you all out there in internet land. Uh, join us again in, uh, in February when uh, Rufus Vaughan Spruce will be giving us his uh, latest findings in regard to the departmental ditties. And in particular, he'll be talking about uh, the, the, the underappreciated man, Stephen Wheeler, um, who, <laughs> the, the man of letters that history forgot. <laughs> Bye for now, everyone.